I think the early years after 1997 did go pretty well. It's true that the Chinese, which was probably always going to happen, um, uh, cut off, contained the nascent moves towards a more accountable democratic system um, and broke their word in doing so because they'd always made it clear that the system should be determined by people in Hong Kong. That's what Liu Ping promised, it was, it's what the foreign ministry promised. But that was sort of predictable. Um, I think what's slightly disturbing is the further we've got away from 1997. Um, the more of there have been signs of um, Beijing turning its back on the joint declaration um, and starting to apply a bit of pressure to Hong Kong's windpipe. Now, I, I'm, I don't necessarily go along with the Taiwanese argument that there have been 160, 170 or more breaches of the joint declaration. I think that's a bit excessive. But I think the attacks on the judiciary and the rule of law, um, I think the implied attacks on academic independence and, um, and excellence. I think that the um, constraints on the free press, um, at their worst, the um, sort of triad-like attack on Kevin Lau, but other um, issues as well. And I think the abductions in Hong Kong without really anyone making a fuss about it. What, what did you think about those abductions? I thought the abductions were um, deeply worrying um, because, I mean, if, if anything was a breach of the joint declaration, then that was. And what you start to think is that the Chinese are almost in denial about the joint declaration being a treaty with another country lodged at the UN. Um, in the first part of the treaty, Britain undertook to do certain things for Hong Kong and Hong Kongers before 1997, and China had the right to object when it got something wrong, in China's view. Since 1997, China's been responsible to the people of Hong Kong for keeping to its side of the bargain on the joint declaration. And the fact that people now in Hong Kong, 20 years after the handover, are asking questions about what's going to happen between now and 2047 is rather worrying. What, 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 however, what I find um, uh, impressive is that, in a way, the more that pressure has been put on Hong Kong, the more people in Hong Kong have asserted, um, in a patriotic way, their sense of Hong Kong Chinese citizenship um, and I think that's an extraordinarily powerful um, thing, which goes, it's um, of course manifested nowadays in, um, in people like Joshua Wong, but it's also um, from their parents' generation as well, um, so that Hong Kong remains, despite the uh, threatening behaviour by Beijing, remains one of the most decent, free societies in Asia with a very, very vigorous civil society. Well, I was going to say, does, do you think that the people's freedoms have been gradually eroded? Do you think their liberties have become worse? I think there has been some erosion of people's freedoms and of some standards. Um, if you give the impression that you can only get on in the public service by towing the line, then inevitably um, it undermines the integrity of, of public service in a way which is ultimately um, pretty damaging. But all that said, I don't want to sound too negative about Hong Kong because I still think that partly because of people's sense of the relationship between economic freedom and political freedom, partly because of people's understanding of the importance of the rule of law, the most um, pessimistic things that people said about one country, two systems people from Milton Friedman to, well, a lot of journalists, um, haven't come true. Um, so I remain an optimist about um, Hong Kong, but worried about whether China will keep its word.
And you've obviously visited Hong Kong many, many times since the handover. How has the city changed? Well, the city's only really changed in the way that it always does, that it's um, the skyline's different every time. I mean, for the first few years, I didn't go back, back very much. I went back the first time, I think, when I was when I'd just written a book about, partly about Hong Kong. Um, and I've gone back, I suppose, um, every other year um, since then. Um, and I will hope to be able to continue to do so. Um, there were lots of things about m my time, our time as a family in Hong Kong, which made it very special for us and very happy. Um, and I'd never want to turn my back on those. What is still true <laughs> is despite the fact that um, every time you go back, um, the skyscrapers are taller and the shopping malls are glitzier. All that's true. Um, but you can still turn a corner and find a bit of um, traditional Hong Kong a street market, um, a, a barber working in the street with, I can remember one scene so vividly, um, with a cigarette between, right at the very end of his, of his fingers, um, and the other hand snipping away at the hair and, and having a very animated um, uh, conversation in Cantonese. So some of what has made Hong Kong special is still there. Jane Jacobs, in her book on the relationship between cities and growth, talks about um, urban clutter as being um, a reason for growth in a city. And I once said that to the late Lee Kuan Yew, who was a, you know, I mean, one, one, nobody should deny his, his success in, in uh, Singapore, but he was always um, slightly envious, I think, of, of Hong Kong. And I said, well, you know, there isn't social engineering in Hong Kong, unlike Singapore. People get on with their lives in a, in a, against a framework of values which um, are kept in place by the law. And he said to me, ah, he said, but if I had your people, my GDP would be 25% higher. And I said, but you wouldn't get people in Hong Kong to behave as though they were in Singapore. It's part of the, the wonderful charm of the place. When Europe was um, still committed to um, greater action by the state, um, to uh, the state running industries and so on, uh, Hong Kong, thanks partly to John Cowperthwaite, but also to people who recognised um, uh, the importance which the Chinese society has put on getting on and looking after yourself. Uh, Hong Kong was exploding as a market economy and doing spectacularly well. And do you think people are more divided now than they were 20 years ago in terms of rich, poor, pro-Beijing, pro-democracy? I can't say that really. Um, I think the f if I was uh, in government in Hong Kong, um, I would keep an anxious eye on the Gini coefficient, um, properly measured, not hidden, as is the case in Beijing, because I think that is a that is a marker of whether a society is probably the best, even though it was invented by an Italian fascist a marker on, on how, um, uh, how much inequality there is in a society. When I was in Hong Kong, one of the um, tremendous pluses for a politician was that you never really had to make choices um, between spending on one thing or spending on another, or cutting taxes or increasing spending or dealing with a fiscal deficit. Because we were at the end of a run of getting on for 30 years, I think 26 years of economic growth. So every year we were able to cut taxes and there was never any suggestion of, a, of an indirect tax um, to 
uh, increase the amount of money in the reserves to build that airport out of revenue rather than out of borrowings, where it would have probably been cheaper if the Chinese um, government had understood the point to, to build it out of borrowing, and to increase spending. So I used to be attacked by, by communists in Beijing for being socialist, for spending money, more money on the health service and education and the disabled and programs like that. I think that um, one area where it's very difficult um, to um, uh, achieve the sort of balance people would like is in the area of, of housing and public housing. And that's partly because of the shortage of land and the pressure. It's partly because of the extent to which I think um, housing has been used as a way of laundering, laundering money out of uh, Beijing, which pushes up the price of property all the time. Uh, and people do get trapped, I think, either trapped in public housing when they'd like to get out and own, um, or trapped without the sort of adequate housing they would like. So I, I think that's probably the um, major area socially of concern. And I was sorry we weren't able to do it, uh, do anything about it when I was there. I think there was always a worry that if we moved too radically on the housing market, it might um, have a damaging effect on uh, individual Hong Kong companies and on the uh, the stock market at a time when we were coming up to 1997 with all those uncertainties. And you said that uh, democracy for Hong Kong is a pipe dream. Uh, what do you think the reality for the future of the city is? I say that um, no, that independence to allow to allow the the argument for democracy, which people like me. Um, feel strongly about, the argument for democracy um, shouldn't be allowed, shouldn't be diluted by morphing into a, an argument for independence, which is simply not going to happen and is a provocation. Um, but I certainly think that Hong Kong will um, be, be democratic one day. And what, what um, do you think will happen at post-2047? Look, I'm 73. Um, in 30 years' time, if I'm around, I'll be 103, and I'm, I'm re reluctant to, um, to think that far ahead. You when, 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 you, when you look at what's just happened in Britain, um, it's dangerous looking 24 hours ahead, let alone any, any further. Um, I hope that the Chinese government will keep their word. Why, in particular? Because of... Um, the position of people in Hong Kong, but also because I think that um, the rest of the world will be watching very carefully to see whether it's true that the Chinese keep their word. So do you think one, t uh, one system, uh, one country, two systems will continue past 2047? Well, that's what, um, well, certainly up to 2047, and the, the question now is whether... Um, Chinese government understand what that means. The phrase one country, two systems is one which they have, which officials in Beijing have parroted a great deal, repeated over and over again. But I sometimes wonder whether they've actually thought through what it means, what two systems, what the Hong Kong system actually means. Um, uh, and I think there's a, there's a, uh, a shortage of knowledge and a paucity of imagination about that. When you hear um, some Chinese communist officials giving Hong Kong lectures about the rule of law, what do they know about the rule of law? I remember when I first talked to Liu Ping, he was a very nice and intelligent and moderate man who I think was probably sometimes driven into saying and doing things which he'd have probably preferred not to do. A wonderful English speaker and very interested in classical music, not least English classical music. Um, I remember Liu Ping uh, talking to me about the rule of law and I said I'd just recently been the British Environment Secretary 
and that while I was in that job, um, you know, a, a huge amount of the time, my decisions were challenged in the courts by groups of activists or um, people who didn't like a planning decision or whatever, environmentalists. And I said, we'd go to court, there'd be a judicial review. And I never really knew whether I'd win or not because the law applied to me and it wasn't just me applying it to other people. So I said, you know, the rule of law means that we're all sub subjected to it. So he said, well, we have, we have that too. And I said, no, you have rule by laws, not of law. And I think it's, it's been a very difficult thing for Chinese communists to understand, and not because they're Chinese, but because they're communists. Um, or they're communists um, in the sense of being authoritarian. I don't think they're very communist in their economic or social policies. Um, perhaps they left that to me. Do, do you think the UK sort of sold out the Hong Kongers by leaving it vague for post-2047? No. I think where... Sorry, would you mind just repeating the question? I, 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 no, I, I don't think that um, we sold out people in Hong Kong by not going beyond 2047. 50 years is a long time. Um, 100 years, 99 years is a long time. It was to be discovered in 1997, but ni 99 years does come around um, eventually. Um, no, I, th I think that um, where we were, um, where we didn't behave very well, was in establishing strong enough foundations early enough for Hong Kong's gradual acquisition of the machinery of accountability, which is a long-winded way of saying that I think after the joint declaration was agreed, we should have been much more active in pushing the case for, um, for democracy or a faster pace of democratization in Hong Kong. We had that absurd consultation exercise in Hong Kong in which people voting for more directly elected seats was morphed into people not voting for more directly elected seats. And it was, it was slate of hand and it was undoubtedly um, driven by the Foreign Office and the overwhelming desire to follow Percy Craddock's view that um, a smooth transition meant doing basically what Beijing wanted. One of my officials used to say, um, I suppose you could call a funeral a smooth transition, which um, has something to be said for it. But I think the, the sort of modest changes that um, Teddy Yude was trying to implement before he died, tragically, and he was a very good man, um, ran into huge resistance from the sort of Craddockites in the in the Foreign Office, and I could never really understand the Craddock position. Craddock was in private and in semi-public far ruder about the Chinese Communist Party than I would ever dream of being. He used to say, they're all thugs. Um, but then he'd behave as though the right thing to do was to go along with whatever they wanted pretty well. And I don't think that was... Um, sensible or honourable. Do you think, um, because obviously we've observed uh, as Hong Kong was a crown dependency then, you know, it would be an overseas territory now, and we've seen like the sovereignty um, referendums in Gibraltar and Falklands, Bermuda, all of those. Do you think Hong Kong should have had a referendum? There was lots of talk on the run up to 97 of having a referendum. You know, you know as I, as I do, Hong Kong Island was in perpetuity. Um, well, look, I'm... Was, Least. Do should, you think there should have been a referendum? Should there have been a referendum in Hong Kong? Um, I'm very much against referendums in general, not just because of what's happened with um, Brexit, um, but I think that um, they're a pretty crude device in, uh, in nation democracies or, or real democracies.
And the problem if you'd had a referendum is that if people had voted um, no to the transfer of sovereignty, um, if that had been the outcome, what would you have done? Because um, the lease ran out in 1997. But it was a good question which um, Emily Lau used to argue regularly, and British ministers, it was the best question. Um, hated her for doing it. Oh, she didn't quite ask it in terms of, of a referendum. Let me tell you one story. I was um, visiting a, a, a mental, a hospital for the mentally ill, not long before I left Hong Kong, um, in the New Territories. And it, it was a very old structure with different wards in sort of the equivalent of Nissen huts with wire around them to keep the um, patients um, in each ward. Um, and I'm walking down the middle and there's a very, very well-dressed Chinese guy who's calling from behind one of these wire fences. Governor Patton, Governor Patton, could you, could you come over and talk to, uh, talk to me? And to the horror of my sort of comet's tale of um, officials, I walk over and talk to him. I mean, you know, it was interesting that this guy in, um, in a three-piece suit um, in a mental hospital, and he's self-confident enough to want to talk to the governor. So I walk across, and he says some complimentary things. And then he says, um, I just want to ask you one question, um, Governor. He said, um, uh, Britain says it's the oldest democracy in the world. So I said, mm, yes, it's sometimes claimed. And he said, um, China is the last great communist power in the world, authoritarian power. And I say, yes. And he said, could you, underst could you therefore explain to me how it is that Britain, the democracy, is handing over Hong Kong to uh, an authoritarian power without consulting the people of Hong Kong? without giving them any choice. <laughs> and I was getting into the car coming back, and one of my officials said to me, it's extraordinary, isn't it? He said that the, the man with the sanest question in Hong Kong is in a mental hospital. <laughs> that was, it was unfair. And in fact, others were, were asking a similar question, like, as I said, Emily Lau, who used to regularly embarrass um, visiting British ministers um, with with that um, with that question, I remember saying to to Jeffrey Howe once after he'd been he'd endured um, uh, some of these questions. It was actually after he'd been foreign minister. Um, isn't she wonderful? And he didn't he, he couldn't understand the point I was making, but she was she was going right to the heart of the matter. And the point, the real answer, was I'm sorry, but there isn't anything we can do about it. Um, and what we should do is to try to give you as much um, uh, as possible in the way of institutional development. <laughs> Darling, Darling, can I hold my phone you back? Yeah, of course. Thanks. Bye. Which darling was it? It was Laura. They've all been trying. I think that was why the phone was going earlier. They all want to say, "Good luck tomorrow, Dad." <laughs> um, how did you feel when you saw the Umbrella Movement? Sorry. How, how did you feel when you saw the Umbrella Movement on TV? You saw all these young protesters come out uh, for democracy and all of that stuff. How, how did how did that make you feel? Well, there were t t two. Um, sentiments. The first was um, I thought how brave they were and how extraordinarily courteous and well organized and disciplined they were. I mean it must be the first mass demonstration with people clearing up litter and and doing homework while it's going on. Uh, so I thought they were behaving um, extraordinarily well and I also thought that it was terrific that 20 years after, well, no, it was by the, then it was 17 years, I suppose, after we'd left um, Hong Kong, there were still all these young people, many of whom wouldn't have been born or certainly wouldn't have been out of elementary school when we left, who held on to the, to the standards which we 
had espoused but not always delivered on. You teach people at university um, to read Adam Smith and, um, and Locke and Amartya Sen. You shouldn't be surprised if they then go out and behave as though the world should be like those people you've taught them to read. Um, the second thing that um, filled me with some uh, concern was that in mass demonstrations like that, even with moderate leadership, it's very difficult for people to understand the point at which they've made their point. Sorry, understand when they've made their point and when they've captured the moral high ground and when it is um, sensible for them to step back. And they treated those who suggested they should step back, people like um, Martin Lee and Cardinal Zen and Anson Chan, as though they were somehow um, collaborators or whatever. But in fact, um, if they had pulled back themselves a bit earlier, they would have left having completely possessed the moral high ground and um, having put all the pressure onto the government to respond. So I'm not criticizing them, but I, just as it, in Tiananmen, though happily without the violent consequences, those sort of demonstrations are always difficult to calibrate. I, th I think that said that uh, uh, Joshua Wong and some of the others are remarkable young people. Um, I think he is um, immensely articulate, very brave, takes the, the long-term view, and in any society, you would be proud of young people like him. We've just um, been, we've all just warmed in Europe to the election of Monsieur Macron. I said to my daughters, you know, or to two of them, he's younger than you. What are you, what are you going to do for your next trick? Um, why, why, why people, why people warm to him? Because he bravely stood up for a set of values which people can identify with. Um, and I think at an earlier age, that's what Joshua Wong and some of his colleagues have done. And it's terribly important that Britain and other countries um, don't let that generation down in the same way that we let their parents' generation down. Uh, my last question is, do you have a message similar to that? Hong Kong. I just, I would just say to Hong Kong that thanks to your belief in what makes it special, um, it still is special. And I hope you never forget that. I think the, the notion of uh, Hong Kong Chineseness will last a lot longer than the Politburo's view of Chineseness, um, because I can't believe that China is totally unlike every other great country and society. Uh, China's been transformed economically since I first saw it in 1979. The surprising thing is looking around the world, it has such a faint footprint given its economic strength and you know you fetch up with a collection of friends who are by and large basket cases you know, Venezuela and Zimbabwe and North Korea um, and the uh, except in the higher education sector where we benefit hugely from the quality of young Chinese um, China isn't making nearly as much of a mark on the world as you might think it should. So my vote goes with um, vote goes to 
Joshua Wong and his colleagues, not to the Politburo.